So in the next couple days, we should start hearing more information about when MLB The Show 22 is gonna drop. And as we get closer to that release date, SDS does this thing where they like to leak out some new legends in the game, trying to get people hyped. Last year, they leaked legends like Hank Aaron, Pedro Martinez, Roberto Clemente, Prince Fielder, and a lot more. And it seems like every year, the legends just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Year before, we got Willie Mays. Year before that, Mickey Mantle. And then, of course, like I said this past year, we got Hank Aaron. So it's going to be really hard to top some of those legends, but I'm going to give you 10 big name players that I actually think could realistically be in the game. Notice how I said realistically? Some cards I don't think. We're not going to get a Barry Bonds. Probably will never be in the game. And I don't think we're going to get a Roger Clemens. His rap's just too bad, even though you might see some guys on this list with similar raps. But let's talk about some players that will not be in the game this year. So once a player retires, it's usually about a three-year window from the time they retire to when they actually are eligible to come back in the game. So some retired players we will not see in MLB The Show 22 include Kyle Seeger, Buster Posey, and Ryan Braun. Really sad about that Ryan Braun one. With the current CBA being up and the possibility that we might not get baseball at the start of April, there's going to be a lot of eyes on MLB The Show because people are going to want baseball during that time frame. So now it's the perfect time to release some of these big name legends that maybe they weren't in years past because of history. But if they do this year, they're going to have a ton of people playing at the start of April. So without Without further ado, here are my 10 legends I want to see in next year's game. But before we get into that, huge shout out to MLB The Show Card Art over on Twitter. All these custom cards he made and he did an absolutely amazing job. Be sure to go follow him over on Twitter. And even if you don't want to buy a custom card that's priced at an insanely reasonable price, he posts a lot of his custom card art all the time over on Twitter. And once again, he just does an amazing job. So shout out to him for making all these cards. So starting out at number 10, we're going to start out with some lesser names and work our name to the big boppers. I got Dontrell Willis from his Rookie of the Year in 2003. Dontrell Willis's career was really weird. He won the Rookie of the Year his first year with a 3.3 ERA, went 14-6, and six, struggled a little bit the next year with a 4.02 ERA, and then went off in 2005 with another All-Star appearance, went 22-10 with a 2.63 ERA, led the league with 7 complete games and five shutouts, pitched 236 innings. He was an absolute workhorse. But it's weird. He had one decent year after that, got traded to Detroit in the Miguel Cabrera trade, and his career went just completely downhill. A lot of that was due to injuries, and he just wasn't productive when he was out on the field. A 9.38 ERA, 7.49 ERA, 5.62, 6.85, he just wasn't productive. A guy who was an all-star caliber player from 2003 to 2006, five years later, he played on three different teams and he was out of the league by 2011, hasn't pitched since. But this is a guy who wants to be in the game and is a noticeable player. Like how many players are actually gonna tweet at MLB The Show being like, hey, I want to be in your game. Let's make it happen. Like seriously, it seems like all SDS has to do is give this guy a call and they'll work some out and he'd be in the game. Next up, we got got Adrian Beltre. You talk about well-rounded players, you cannot not include Adrian Beltre. Five gold gloves in his career, four silver sluggers, and six top 10 MVP finishes. The card I'm basing off of is from his 2004 season where he won the silver slugger. He also finished second in MVP voting. That year he had 200 hits, 48 home runs, 121 RBIs, a 334 average, 388 on base with a 1017 OPS, a 163 OPS plus. And like I said, he plays gold glove defense over at third base. This guy's a monster. You could make a variety of different cards with him and you could give him a 99 overall card on three different teams. The Dodgers, the Mariners, and the Rangers. So like I talked about earlier in this video, when a player retires, they have about a three year window that's kind of been on record for when a player is eligible to come back into the game as a legend. And Ichiro kind of fits that mold. He essentially retired in 2017. He only played 15 games 2018 and two in 2019. And I believe if I'm remembering correctly, it was the Japanese series that was the very first series of the year. And after that, he was done. So if you don't count the Japanese series, then it's been about three years since he retired. So right in that time frame. 
This was a guy who came over to the U.S. from Japan in 2001 and only won MVP, Rookie of the Year, a Gold Glove, a Silver Slugger, and an All-Star appearance. He started his career with 10 straight seasons of over 200 hits, a career batting average of 311, over 500 stolen bases in his career too, Gold Glove defense with a cannon of an arm over in right field. I have the card memorizing his 3,000th hit, which he actually hit with the Marlins. But there's a variety of different cards you could get for an Ichiro. Like I said, he won Rookie of the Year and MVP, has multiple Gold Glove and Silver Sluggers awards, most known for his days with the Mariners, where he could get a signature card or a bunch of other variety of cards, but he also did get his 3,000th hit with the Marlins. But something cool is in his career, if you combine his stats with Japan and the US, he actually has more hits than even Pete Rose got. Obviously, it doesn't count for U.S. statistics, but having a card concept, kind of combining his statistics from the two different leagues would be a really cool feature to have. Fan favorite, must-have card. Unsure how we do with a very low lack of power, but the contact speed, arm, he's just always a fun card to use. So in next year's game, I want to see more legends that are at scarce positions. For example, Adrian Beltre, third baseman. I want to see more third baseman that I can use. But another scarce position is starting rotation. I feel like we see the same starters. Like there's no diversity with the starters. Everybody's using Gram, Otani, Verlander. There's just no diversity. So that's why seeing a legend like Roy Holiday would be super cool. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple years ago. But during his playing days, he was one of the best starting pitchers. They've not the best in the entire league. He's one of the few starting pitchers who have won a Cy Young in the American League with the Blue Jays and then in the National League with the Phillies. He also threw a perfect game in the playoffs. He was a workhorse who constantly led the league in complete games, very rarely missed a start, and was consistently around 220 to 250 innings pitched in a year. Roy Haldai was one of the nastiest pitchers from his time with the Blue Jays and from his time with the Phillies. Consistent Cy Young contender who would be amazing to add to the game. Now getting into some big time power hitters, I got Manny Ramirez. We had a big poppy like a year ago. It's only right that we add Manny Ramirez, his counterpart, the one-two punch, Batman and Robin to the game as well. Those two were the reason for Boston's success for so long. And honestly, I'm kind of unsure why he hasn't been added to the game yet. Was a consistent 30 to 45 home run a year player. He also hit for a high average. He hit 313 for his entire career with a 411 on base, a 585 slugging, and a 996 OPS. That's a 154. OPS plus for his career. Somehow he never won MVP, but there was an eight year stretch where he finished in the top 10 in MVP voting. He was terrible in the outfield, but man could he hit and he'd be one of those fun players in MLB to show because he'd have high contact, he'd have huge power, big PCI, and he's another card you could have a variety of different options with. He had some amazing years with Cleveland and he was also a tank in Boston, like I said, helping them win World Series. Plus, do you guys remember Manny Wood taking piss in the green monster. The dude was a freaking clown, but man, he was fun to watch. So the next two cards I'm gonna show you make sense in my mind because we're kind of in a CBA gruntle. I don't even know if that's a freaking word. But the last time there was a strike in baseball was 1994. That year, we didn't even get a World Series. The players and the owners just couldn't agree on anything. Well, I don't think this will get that deep. After that 1994 season, baseball kind of died. They really lost a lot of the casual fan base that they had. Once baseball stopped for a full calendar, year, a lot of people just never went back. A lot of people are saying what saved baseball was the home run race between Sammy Sosa and then Mark McGuire, who are my number five and four players. 1998, 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002, it was a constant back and forth for home run champ between Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. Sammy Sosa, we just saw some unbelievable numbers. 1998, he hit 66 home runs and came in second. He followed that up with a 63 home run campaign, still didn't lead the league in home runs before finally doing it with 50 in 2000. And he finished second again with 64 in 2001 before leading it in 2002. Three 60 home run campaigns in a four year window and your home run crown came when you hit 50. That's just cause a couple of those years, he was straight up out slugged by Mark McGuire where he broke records. Led the league in home runs in 96 with 52, got a few more with 58 and 97 before going full on freaking Super Saiyan mode in 98 and 99. He broke the record in 98 with 70 
home runs. Granted, that record did not last very long before Barry Bonds broke it, but 70 home runs in a freaking season? Are you kidding me? And he followed that up with a 65 home run campaign in 1999. These two were unbelievable after that CBA strike in 1994, and I truly believe they saved baseball, so I feel like it should be perfect to add them to this year's game. This next card might be a stretch, because he does kind of fall into that category with like the Roger Clemens, the Barry Bonds, plus he's kind of a douche. But let's get Alex Rodriguez in the game. Everybody knows the nickname. Even casuals know his nickname because he's a marketable player. He's very well known. Grant, he may not be well liked, but he was a Yankee. They have a absolutely huge market. A-Rock cards were always well liked in the MLB of the show community. And like I said, you want that big name? A-Rod's that big name. Plus, A-Rod likes money. I don't think he has anything against SDS. So they come out there with a can't refuse offer. I think he would sign on the dotted line. My biggest thing with MLB The Show and their legends is they exclude some of the biggest name in sports. Like I mentioned Barry Bonds, he's the home run leader. Pete Rose is the hits leader, they're not in the game. But A-Rod is one of the biggest names in the game of all time. He was four home runs short of 700 for his career, over 2,000 RBIs, three MVPs, six straight seasons of over 40 home runs and 100 RBIs. Prime A-Rod, you could say, is a top three player of all time. And in case you haven't got the trend, I like players that we could see numerous his cards from in this year's game. A-Rod falls on that bill too. He could get a 99 when he played in Seattle as a freaking teenager. The guy came up at 18 years old. Bro, I graduated high school at 18. You could also see him in an MVP where he signed the biggest deal in MLB history with the Rangers. And he also signed the biggest deal in MLB history when he signed with the Yankees. Another team you could see a 99 overall card for. Variety of different options. Big time name. I think it's time to bury the hatchet and get A-Rod back in MLB the show. So if I I was a betting man, these next two cards, I'm feeling so confident in them being in the game and they're gonna be some of the bigger names that SDS leaks out. Number two is gonna be Randy Johnson. When you talk about the best pitchers of all time in their prime, you have to include Randy Johnson. The guy won four straight Cy Youngs from 1999 to 2002 with the Diamondbacks. He also won one in 95 with the Mariners, which is where this card concept is coming from. He won the pitching trip Triple crowned in 2002, where he went 24 and 5 at a 2.32 ERA, 260 innings with 334 strikeouts. And as I said before, we need to get some more players at scarce position. I mentioned starters when I said Roy Holiday. Randy Johnson's a starter. On top of that, he's left handed. We have no big time left handed pitchers in the game. I feel like Araldus Chapman's the biggest, most usable one, and he's a bullpen arm. Get a big time lefty in the game like Randy Johnson and make him as good as he actually was in real life. This is a card that if they made him truly as good as he was in real life, I'd a thousand percent be okay with him being the big time collection reward. That's how good Randy Johnson was. That's how good I feel like they could make him. And he's at a valuable position with not a lot of left-handed options. I have a good feeling Randy Johnson's gonna be in the game. And honestly, I think he might be one of the better cards we see next year. But I think the number one card we'll see next year and that I'm feeling very confident in is we are gonna get a Derek Jeter. I don't know how good Derek Jeter would be in MLB The Show just because he wasn't a big time power hitter. He was maybe a little bit on the overrated side on defense. Contact hitters just haven't played good in MLB The Show in recent games. But it's more so from the selling standpoint that SDS would have with this release. Derek Jeter is an icon in baseball. Even casuals, people who don't even really watch the game know who Derek Jeter is. He's an icon in the sport like Kobe is with the NBA. He's the type of player that you would put on the cover of the game because it make it more marketable. Kind of like what they did with Griffey in 2017. And with the current CBA agreement, I don't know how that affects the cover art process. Now is the perfect time to do something like this. He retired in 2014, was a first ballot Hall of Famer a couple years ago, over 3,000 hits in his career, 260 home runs, 1311 RBIs. He also had over 350 stolen bases, hit 310 with a 377 on base, 8 17 OPS, and even though he might be considered overrated on defense, he did have a couple gold glove seasons. From a marketing standpoint, I think this is a can't miss opportunity for SDS. Like I said, I don't know how good the card would be, probably have like 120-ish contact with
with 90 power, 90 fielding, and that's being very generous. But if you put him on the cover and leak out he's going to be in the game, you're probably going to get a lot of casuals buying this game, especially if baseball is not starting on time. There you boys have it. Here are the 10 legends that I think are going to be in MLB The Show 22. If I'm optimistic, I'm actually hoping we see some even bigger names coming to the game, like a Roger Clemens, like a Barry Bonds, bringing back some old school legends. I'm super excited for MLB The Show 22. We'll start getting some more legend reveals over the next two months or so, and hopefully in the next couple days, we get the release date and the cover for the game. Anyways, boys, hopefully you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments section your legend predictions. Who is the number one legend you want to see in this year's game? And I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out.